So tonight's first speaker is Reverend Azariah France Williams. He's now based in Manchester, recently was in Teddington, and his book Ghost Ship, published really a week ago, has already started making waves, not just within the Church of England, but much wider, as it shares stories of pain and progress for racial justice within the Church of England. He's long been a friend of the fellowship over the year that I've been involved, and it's a privilege to hand over to him to hear what he has to say. Azariah, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. It's, uh, uh, it's great that we've been able to take some time together to think about this very um, important and vital topic. And there's a, a key question which we're um, considering this evening. So it's great to have you all here. I'm going to read something from, uh, from the book, uh, Ghost Ship, which, uh, which describes something of my own experience and perhaps later on in the breakout groups or in the questions and answers later, you might want to uh, pick up or refer to, to some of this. I'm beginning speaking where, I'm beginning uh, the story where there's been a, I, I'm in the process of finding a church to settle with. And there's a church that has been interested in, in maybe having me on their team. And I've not been so sure. And so, we pick it up where I'm talking to the bishop about this, um, this invitation. My first surprise came when the bishop admitted he already knew of their interest. I was confused as to what this meant. I was not feeling entirely at peace with the ship I was been invited to join. It looked great from the outside, but as the first potential clergy person of colour they'd ever had, with a huge multicultural congregation, I had a quiet sense of dread. I thought I was dealing, I thought, I thought I was dealing with two separate entities, but I was mistaken. There was and is a reality behind the buildings and the titles that held the white upper middle and upper classes together. Behind the curtain, they were all sharing a dressing room. The bishop approved of the idea of this church and I realized he thought this through saying, we don't have the central funding to bring you back, but the church has the resources to provide a stipend, which is a form of salary and provision of housing, and get you back to the city. He was handing me over to them, or was he selling me to them? What was I worth? I was not to be part of the central system of recompense. Instead, I'll be on the church's payroll and governed by their laws. I was a rare commodity in that I was a black man from the smallest nation in the Western Hemisphere, operating on one of the most confident dioceses in one of its most famous of its churches. So I realized the church occupied a place of power over and all with the bishop, and their collective decisions would be over and against me. I went on to join the diocese, and when ordained, had these sentiments confirmed. There are a number of difficult instances I could recount but concerns from my publisher and my own sense of exposure prevented me from saying more. What could be the historical roots of this dread that I felt? In the days of slavery, there was an understanding of slavery as social death. M. Sean Copeland documents the legal standing in parts of America where slaves were not allowed to speak against a white person in court. They were not allowed to defend themselves when attacked. I discussed this book with my publisher, stating what a poor employer the Church of England was to many people of colour. They requested I found evidence to show that this wasn't my, only my own story. I tried, but found and again and again, people would say the following. Let me tell you this thing that happened to me, but don't put it in the book. Or they'd say, this is for your ears only. Eventually, I crafted a survey and offered anonymity. And the truth and pain flooded into my inbox. And this was the tip of the iceberg. There are others whose pain sits on paperwork in courtrooms or is discussed in closed boards and committees. Sometimes years drag by as they seek justice but have to protect the predators. Anthony Reddy documents, due to the effects of racialized oppression and marginalization, many black people may be suspicious or even reluctant to talk in depth about their personal stories or experiences. This reluctance is exacerbated if the person seeking to initiate the conversation is white. 
I then go on to speak about a movement called the Sons of Africa. In the book I've described um, some key people, one of them Otaba Kujano. Otaba Kujano was a founding member of the Sons of Africa in 1787, seen as Britain's first black political group, which had black London leaders coming together to plan and prepare for purpose. It was made up of those who had formerly been slaves or who had parents who had been slaves. They supported each other with their individual projects and they embarked on collective projects together, adding their signatures to letters, speaking as a group. They were public figures. Kujano and Olodo Equiano were both published authors. They were also involved in arts and culture. They had political clout. From this base, they also worked with other groups, with willing whites who were supporters in the struggle. I'd love to be part of a movement like that, a sons and daughters of Africa. One time I nearly was part of a movement like that. I hustled an invite to a small audience with none other than Michael Curry, the head of the American Episcopal Church. It was held in an iconic home, the former home of John Collins, Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King had both visited this place. Attached to a visit to a neighboring cathedral, Michael was to meet with us and then head off with the mighty throng who'd only see him as, as a speck in the distance. We, however, would be in touching distance of our big brother in the struggle. Was this my Sons of Africa moment? There was an impressive cast of academics, culture leaders, conscious clergy and political thinkers. This was my experience of walking into what I thought was a low to moderate threat level environment and having to upgrade my assessment pretty quickly. Brave slave, who can know, I can't confirm or deny, it's an alter ego, penned the following account. This poem's called Quarantine. It's all about love, said the pot-bellied, purple shirt wearing, ebony smiley prime preacher primate. The royal wedding preacher warm my inner climate. Yet my hand is outstretched but remains empty. My hope was outstretched but remains empty. Zoom in to that fateful afternoon, witness me excited entering the room. He arrives and is marched upstairs to meet his conversation partner. He's quarantined away from us, and I would rather his time was spent, was lent to the waiting hopeful remnant. The advance guard was a white right man. Comes to warm up the crowd, explain the plan, ensure we're on the same page. That's when I realize it's all staged and the director, producer, lead actor is this white man, an always right man, was the wrong man for this nightmare. From the very beginning, he asserted control. I'm an artist and feel this stirring in my soul. Something feels strange, it's all prearranged. We've been edited out of this moment before it's even begun. Beyond words is my grief as I speak in tongues. When we the people sit, it becomes not one room but two. An invisible partition falls into position as this white right man states in terms and conditions. He wanted a task force as a modern day Wilberforce. He asked, why are black people not ascended to the highest positions of leadership? I answered, when white men and right men move out of the spotlight, take our lead and then join our fight then. But my lips were still. I had answered in my mind as I felt intimidated by the projection of his weakness of strength. My hope was incinerated. He continued. Did we all want to be involved in this big problem he was aiming to solve? He then laid down the law as he determined our activity. Feet firmly on the floor, he demanded our passivity. He explained Michael Curry is in a hurry, but I knew he'd been sequestered above our heads. 30 minutes we'd already waited. I grew frustrated, he explained. There'll be no participation from the gathered congregation, the Q&A within close conversation. If that didn't seem too much, he made another prohibition. This time, no touch. No touch was permitted. We were told not to pounce. After that, one or two guests decided to bounce. The people in the room could have been a movement, but we'll never know because we're instructed not to move. Michael Curry could have held us blessed to spoken comfort to our tribulation, but he didn't even hear our names. Thank you. I'll be sharing with you later. Thank you very much, Mr. Ryan.
we now go to hear from Farai Mapamula, Methodist minister serving churches in the Birmingham area. She's a powerful advocate for the marginalized and oppressed. And if I'm honest, someone I've always wanted to hear preach, but never been in the church, in the right church at the right time. Farai, over to you. The church does not exist in a vacuum. It exists in and as part of society, a society in which racism and systemic is systemic and institutionalized. If racism is a problem across society, it is a problem in the church. I also agree with Professor Anton Reddy when he speaks about how parts of our society embraces a certain form of nostalgia that employs selective amnesia as a tool to reimagine or remember the past. We only remember what we want to remember, the good old days and pride of empire. My own experiences as a black minister and these are only illustrations of the reality of racism in our society. So let's begin with some everyday assumptions I live with about my heritage, about my education, even though I trained at the same institution as a majority of my peers. Assumptions even about my integrity. I've been asked if I joined ministry, so as a failed asylum seeker, I could get free housing and an assured pension. I still remember how that made me feel. It was repeated again during my years of probation in this area. When I got talking to somebody about family, well, you got a house now, don't you? One morning, some, someone walked into one of the churches that I served. I introduced myself as a minister of that church, and their response was, is this what we get for our sins? I just replied, yes, and I walked off. But none of the members present said anything or did anything. On another occasion, I led an ecumenical act of worship. While we had the obligatory tea and coffee afterwards, a high-ranking civic leader asked me, who are you? One would have thought the castle was a giveaway, but hey ho. So I explained I was a minister in that, in that church. You are the leader here? Yes, I said. No, I mean, who's the real leader here? Who do you report to? I was getting a bit unhappy by this point. And my reply was, we are Methodists. We are guided and led by committees and we report to each other. He didn't like that. Stuff like being told to keep my head down until I got ordained when things were not going so well, being torn policed, oh, you're just being emotional. You are being too dramatic. Oh, don't worry about this. This has happened in the past before. Or oh, people just, concentrate on the way I speak words or my accent is thick, they can't understand me, or use the wrong word or pause when I shouldn't, and they miss the whole content and essence of my message. The same goes for identity and foreign sounding names. I've been asked to shorten my name. I've also been asked, what is your real name? What is your Christian name? What is a Christian name anyway? So there is a culture of white normativity supported by white privilege against blackness as the counterculture. That's our work together as society and the church should create a new reality or environment that engenders and boldens anti-racism as a counter-consciousness. So yeah, Black Lives Matter as a movement and as a quest for racial justice offers us just that. But I also hear people responding that all lives matter and I think that's a problem because it's a diversion, a destruction, a refusal to acknowledge that right now we're thinking about how black people have been disregarded, undermined, mistreated, and even killed just for being black. Why is it so hard to think about someone else without even thinking about including ourselves? Of course, there are a lot of people who feel disregarded and mistreated and forgotten who are not black. I agree with that. But the problem, I think, is that we conflate wealth with white privilege. But they are two different things. One may be wealthy, educated, and black, but still suffer racism. One may be white and poor, but still have whiteness on their side. The color of one's skin seems to decide our standing in society and how we are perceived by the other. 
I might add that those other groups have whiteness on their side, meaning a system of power and privilege that has seen policies and procedures being created and fine-tuned over a long period of time to protect and uphold white superiority over any other race. Because my white sisters and brothers do not have to deal with the everyday racism that I'm subjected to. They don't have to, they don't have the added burden of being treated as a lesser person or as a threat or as unworthy or less capable simply because of the color of their skin. Because of their white privilege, they don't have to deal with those things on top of whatever else people are dealing with. White privilege means one will never be criminally racially profiled because crime we know is racialized only when it comes to black people. One never hears of white crime or white on black crime, but there are plenty of narratives regarding black crime or black on black crime. White privilege means the education system will always be on one side. So would be the justice and health systems. You name it, if one that is white privilege upheld by white normativity. It is not about individuals, but about a system that gives advantage to one group at the expense of others, but then allows individuals to get away with racist attitudes and practices. And this does exist in our churches. Because the church is a cross section of society, hence the same unjust practices are inherent in our churches. And the church is complicit, especially when it remains, when it remains silent because silence is collusion and silence is violence. When we stand silent as church, we are guilty bystander. As guilty as the cop who had his knee on the neck of George Floyd. But then what does this mean for all of us as church? What does it mean for us as peacemakers? I just, I suggest that what destabilizes communities and robs them of peace is inequality. Inequality in the distribution of wealth, inequality to access to education, higher education, and eventually employment, the exclusion and criminalization of young black men, inequality in the health system, inequality in the justice system itself. Yet we are called to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our Lord, not paying lip service to it. We are called to active participation in calling for and ensuring justice for the list of these, those on the margins, those forgotten by society. Justice seeking involves compassion that leads to activism. We are called to humility as church. If we are to deal with racism, we need to relinquish our pride, our power and our privilege and to do it with humility and repentance. God is peace loving, is a peace loving God. And God, our God is a peacemaking God. The whole story of redemption climaxing in the death and resurrection, resurrection of Jesus Christ is God's strategy to bring about a just and lasting peace between humanity and God's self, and then between individuals and their fellow humans. God's children or people have a character of their father. What and who God loves, we love. What God pursues, we pursue. We can only be known as God's people by whether we are willing to make sacrifices for peace the way God in Christ did. So when the church offers conflict resolution and reconciliation without addressing the issue that causes conflict and injustice in the first place, we are papering over cracks, applying a plaster on a gaping wound, refusing to lance the boil because racism is an injustice and its existence does not engender peace but instead emboldens hate and inequality. I think this is for all of us a pivotal moment where all of us as humanity have the collective power to decide which way we fall on the side of justice and equality or on the side of hate and selective ignorance and maintaining the status quo. Because racism is not just over there in America or in other parts of the world, it is present and prevalent in our society too. But then, hey ho, the prophet Micah challenges us. He has shown you all mortal what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Thank you.
you very much, Farai. It's weird in these settings not to be able to applaud both of you to encourage you in what you've shared in as we reflect on the challenges it brings, but uh, I'm certainly applauding and upholding you both, so thank you. So, Azarar and Farai, the floor is yours, first of all, based on what you've heard from each other. So, um, yes, if I'll, I'll uh, uh, make a start, I, uh, Farai, I, I so appreciated hearing uh, your heart, your stories, and just very, very dynamic. And I wonder, the question that I'm asked by white colleagues often is, uh, where's the hope? Where's the hope in your stories? I want some hope. Give me some hope. And I wonder, Fry, what is your relationship with the word hope in, uh, in relation to uh, matters of racial justice? The first thing I said when I was talking was that the, my own experiences, these tidbits of my experience, are just illustrations of the presence of racism in our society and in our churches. But that's not to say that's, that's my entire experience of my ministry. There's massive hope where I am. There's the fact that I'm speaking to you right now, that's the hope we hold together. There's solidarity, there's empowerment from our leaders. There is, um, I don't want to say allow, is this permission for us to talk to one another. And that's where the lie hopes for me, where we can now speak as we, you and I are doing now. I don't remember the last time I spoke to another black person about racism in a room full of other people, other disciples. That has never happened for me in the last four years. But then it is happening now. That is hope for us, that our leaders, our colleagues, our, our brothers and sisters are saying to us, let's talk about this, find hope somewhere, find activism, where we are together as a people of God, trying to forge a way forward all together, all, every one of us. That's where my hope lies. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you, thank you. Do you have a question for me? I have another one for you, but I'm happy to, to share. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just loved your reading. I love poetry and I, I could hear some of the stuff that you were reading. It, 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 it's poetic, it's like a song. And uh, I wanted to find out what informs your literary style. What, what hmm. sort of reading has yeah. emboldened you as a, as, a, as a minister and as a writer? Thank you. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a lovely question. I think one of the first things that comes to mind is my, my mother. Um, may she rest in peace. Uh, she, um, as I grew up, she would read me uh, Bible stories. Um, she would take on the different accents of the, of the characters. Um, she would make me laugh. She really gave me um, a sense of home when I would arrive home from school, she would ensure that I did a little dance before coming into the house um, to ensure that a sense of positivity and a sense of life, that whatever had gone on outside of the house, within the home, I was safe and I was secure. Mm. And she would sing. And so I think there's something, she would tell stories. So there's something of, of my, um, my mother's uh, life work there. And then um, when I think of uh, uh, my father, who's more academic, uh, he's a poet, he, uh, he wrote music. I thought and, so. Yeah, and so there's, uh, you know, th there's, uh, that music is, uh, it has been, was around me and that music is within me. And then if you want to, you can look at it in another way. I discovered when I was 35, I don't know if you think I'm even arrived at 35 yet. <laughs> I discovered I was dyslexic and dyspraxic. And so, yeah, so my brain is wired differently. And so I, I come at things from a different angle. Um, and, you know, I, I have a... A, a different box from which I draw my resources from. Mm -hmm. And so when I was writing this book, to be, to be honest with you, when I first began writing it, 
I was writing it, I was trying to do something academic. I was yeah. really trying to, to, to get it in a particular style. But you know what, I was really boring myself. <laughs> mm. and, and I thought, I need to write a book that I'm going to enjoy reading. Yeah. And so I had to free myself to be myself and find my own authentic voice. And mm. that happened to be something which was playful, that had lots of wordplay to it, that included poetry, included bits of songs. Um, if you, if you um, find the book, you'll find it's got some fiction in it. Um, you know, I, I really kind of go to town on the genres in mm. order to, to tell a story um, of a heavy topic, but hopefully at times holding it in a light way so that we're able to hold this together. I, I see it as a piece of art, really. And mm -hmm. so, so that's, uh, yeah, that's behind uh, the process. So thank you. No one's asked me that question before. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed listening to you reading it. It, it. it was beautiful. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm curious, um, who's been one of your um, key inspirations? So when things have been difficult, some of the incidents you mentioned, you know, who is it that you'd reach for um, to talk to on the phone or whose book is it you'd pick up or which memory would you evoke uh, to, to hold you in place and to reinsert that sense of God's calling vocation, no matter what the hurdles that were thrown around you were? I've got a very strange answer for you because uh, my go-to place when I'm not feeling okay or I need time out with myself. I love music and I play loud music, all sorts, all sorts. Or I go to concerts and just, just bury myself, or just immerse myself in loud music. And I really love that. And I love poetry. I like Maya Angelou, I like Remy, I like all sorts, Khalil Gibram. I like that kind of, uh, uh, spiritual poetry that can mm. allow me to go into another place and just forget about who I am and just be in a little place where words can play with me, song plays with my conscience. And I, I, I just find that quite therapeutic. Yeah, that's what I do. I love music. That's wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to um, um, look at some of those things after this. That, Thank you. That's, that's, that's great. Okay, as you've been chatting, some folks have begun to put some questions in the chat. Yeah. So if anyone else has any initial questions or thoughts that came out of your group, now's your chance to type them into the chat. Um, there's a question by Mary Sin, and she says, how should uh, people of color or persons of color ministers deal with everyday racism within their congregations? I find sometimes it's good to pull somebody aside and just be honest about how we feel about things. And instead of being angry and aggressive, call, I call people to the side and explain why I think that is offensive or not even think how that has made me feel and I give reasons why I felt that way and sometimes I even give an example or something that happened in history why this has why this is offensive because of such 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 and such and such and I always try to give people some tool to deal with uh, uh, their circumstances or a, a reading or a gospel reading, for example, where we, we are all the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, that sort of thing. So try to refocus somebody's attention onto something that is inclusive and says of God's love for all of us rather than a certain group of people. And uh, I also have heard from friends and family and extended family talking about this word has always been okay. Why is it not okay now? And I said, because now is now and then was then. Hmm. Now it is no longer for these reasons. It is no longer. We cannot continue to use ignorance as excuse 
We can no longer do that now. We can't afford to carry on pretending we can't see. This is why, why I spoke about that um, uh, uh, nostalgia that is selective in its way it wants us to remember as a tool. It, it, it is quite tricky in the way we can only remember certain things and not the others. This is why sometimes you cannot see the dark underbelly of Christianity as a re religion, what happened in the past, how that was used to propagate colonialism, for example. But if we want to tackle racism and get to understand why we are where we are, that will help us to forge forward. But by pretending that the past has never happened, this is why we we'll always carry this thing about, well, it shouldn't be offensive. Well, offensive. Well, it doesn't matter. It does matter because this is how people are subjected to, to dehumanization. And uh, I, I gave an example of a Christian name of somebody asking me what my Christian name was. It is Farai. That is the name I was given by my parents. That is the name in which I was baptized. So that's my Christian name. But when people actually say that, they are used to the imperial or rather colonial way of baptism, where the minister would say, what is your child's name? And I, my parents would say, Anon's Gufainyore, then says, because they can't pronounce it, from today onwards, you're called Mark. I'm not Mark. My name is Gufainyore. So we learn to understand each other's names and cultures and make them, hold them important instead of, trying to demean or reduce someone else's history because we want to uphold our own. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Thank you, Farah. I, um, on that question, I think I've got a couple of things. One is um, uh, a kind of a white response. And then the other one is, um, is a person of color response. And I remember I went on retreat and whilst I was uh, surprised to see uh, quite a senior clergy person um, and we were both on retreat together and so the retreat acted as a kind of a, a, a demilitarized zone you know there was no rank there and so we sat down to have breakfast together and he and I was there on retreat doing some writing actually so I began to talk about what I was doing and he spoke about um, a, uh, a black colleague that he had and another senior person saying, you know, whenever they're not there, race isn't on the agenda. I said, so why is that? I said, well, yeah, when they're not there, we don't think the rest of us who are white don't think about being white. And he said, you know what? He said, they get pulled in a lot to, to talk about race. And I, I think it's really detracting from their role. So I said, well, if you took more time to speak about being white, in places that person would, wouldn't need to go around as much and talk about being black in places <laughs> yes yeah. so i think there is the, you know the, um there, there is a role there and sometimes people um can see what's happening since i've written my book one of the unexpected responses is a number of white friends and old colleagues contacting me and saying i'm really sorry I was in a particular context and I could see that there was some racial prejudice at play and I didn't say anything. And I'm really sorry, please forgive me. And you know, it's, it's fascinating that people do see or detect when people, when, when things happen. And so there's a, a pastoral role, but there's also a prophetic role, which is to speak mm -hmm. up and to speak out. Mm -hmm. One of the people on this, um, this Zoom, I'm, I'm going to embarrass a little bit possibly, and it's someone called Canon E. Pitts. Um, who, who, who is in the room, um, another person from Birmingham. There's a lot of good things coming out of Birmingham. Um, and she, appears, and <laughs> she appears in this book. I do an interview with her, so if you want to know more, you'll have to buy the book and <laughs> find out. But one of the things that she said to me was, um, make sure that you're connected to your community. You know, and so if you're a person of colour, make sure that you are, that you, you've got people around you, otherwise you can feel quite exposed. You can feel, um, you know, that, um, so for example, just a couple of days ago, a white colleague said, would you come along to a book group and talk about your book? Which I'm not, you know, I'm not talking just theory, this is my personal experiences. So I said, yes, but kind of bring a friend or two with me, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. you know, and, um, and so it's important to make yourself safe. Um, if you're going to be sharing things of a personal uh, nature. 
link to that just to chip in watching some of the questions um it's somewhere between uh, one of the groups and ian's question both the positive and the negative if the church structures um are causing problems and pain how can we help bring about the church that recognizes the pain but lifts people up and so it's comfortable accepting and being honest as some people as Rai, you just said were feel able to pick up the phone and say you know what i got that wrong how can the church be that space and linking that to the other question which is does that need to be top down or actually would it only ever happen if it goes bottom up hmm. Hmm. i don't know how best to answer that but I can only say this has been my response to my colleagues and friends about um, the experiences we've had in the past few months. Uh, I've had responses from friends about how they've experienced this time regarding uh, racial injustice. And I, I always take this question back to all of us as a group because we work together as a group and I say to them, so what are we gonna do together? We, we are now holding these stories on our lap. What are we gonna do with them? Because we're trying to shy away from um, a, a, a situation where it becomes about one person. This is the go-to person. Shall we ask um, so-and-so? Shall we uh, go to so-and-so? I think that is burdening this person and asking for answers where they aren't. Because I think prophetically, we are all disciples of Christ. We all need to work together. I listen, I speak you speak, I listen, and we learn together and take some responsibility. Because uh, what I think might be a, a danger if we kind of expect answers from a certain group of people is we are setting them up for a fall. Because we're expecting too much from too few people. Why don't we take the gospel as it is? That this is the gospel for all of us, not just one person. We are called to be disciples. We are called to be on the margins. We are called to seek justice for the list of this, not just particular people, all of us together. So I, I just think we, it's, this is our responsibility together as disciples of Christ. Great, um, that's wonderful. I, um, for me, I, uh, if, you, um, if you get to engage with the ideas in the book, you'll see that are some hopeful for individuals and those to change for the institution i'm i'm challenging whether whether it can change itself um without outside help and i think um you know so one of the things that can happen is people can say well if we have um more um clergy of color in senior positions well that might fix it but what i argue is actually the structure as in the question was phrased is is so harmful to people that you just have more people who are suffering mm -hmm. um and another thing that can happen is uh someone will, for a quick win the church might give someone extra responsibility and say okay you're um a, a black a brown vicar over here you come and talk about racial justice or you create this um, this this pack or whatever but there are no extra resources given for yeah. that to actually yeah. be carried out and so therefore this person now who already has a full load is is um has a much bigger um thing to deal with and they're not able to succeed at any of the things um but because of their commitment to the cause you know and they're they're wanting to help actually um they get landed with something mm -hmm. and the senior person involved they get the, um, the the plaudits of having put someone in place to to cover something but if the resources aren't there it's not going to help often we're also asked to be part of the presentation of a thing but not the production of, of of those things and so um that all needs to be rooted out i'm not sure the church can do it on its own i think systematically i th i think the church has been doing just that what you've just described though pull out um a few people of color and uh, put them in these positions where they are being set up for a fall, like I've just said, where there are no resources to uphold this big responsibility, where they're expected to do these wonders for the church to change. But it's not their responsibility as individuals. It's our responsibility together. If we're going to have any systemic change, 
it has the, to be top, bottom, and bottom up. All of us together, we, need, we have a responsibility to make sure change comes. But where it, where it comes to uh, the structures themselves, we need to question leadership. We need to question who holds the power, who holds the purse, who holds the money to provide resources for things to change. Who holds the power? Who gets listened to? Who gets to speak? All those things will make sure that there's systemic change. But if you and I can talk like we are doing today with no resources, it's pointless. Okay. Sorry, I clicked the wrong button on Zoom, so I lost everything for a moment there. I wasn't going silent. I'd love to put some resource into exploring this more. And I've seen some good questions, obviously highlighting the importance of Racial Justice Sunday. But if we want to move it beyond, great, we've done Racial Justice, we downloaded the CTBI pack and want to take it further. Um, how can we do this? When I say more honestly, I was particularly struck with, um, again, some of Canon and Eve's input into Azariah's book, um, where there's an element of, we've been around elements of this conversation before. And just like you were saying for Rai, we get to a point and then somehow it always stops. Is that simply about lifting up more leaders or actually do we need to do more radical things like reshape the theological training so there's a wider breadth of um, background that ministers are trained in, etc. Uh, speaking of um, theological training for ministers, it, it does include liberation theology. They, they, they have full modules on the liberation theology. And right now, as we speak, there's an existence of um, black theology at Queen's Foundation. So I think there has to be um, appetite for our districts and our uh, circuits and all our clergy to get involved, get engaged with that. And what I found interesting is I was talking to friends about, in the Methodist Church, we've got an EDI toolkit that speaks about the all nine protected characteristics by, by um, 2010 and the law that says all these characteristics are protected. And it's been there for over 10 years now, or now maybe more or less, uh, just around that time. And I was talking to people who said they wanted me to come and speak in their group about this EDI toolkit. And I said, well, it's on the Methodist website. And this person said, I've never heard of it. And I said, well, 18 months ago, I ran an EDI um, uh, symposium or rather workshop at Reimagine Conference. And I remember you, and I did give you a copy, a hard copy of that. Do you remember? Oh yeah, that, yes. And I said, yeah, that. So I think sometimes we, we engage in things, we talk about it, we go to conferences, speak about these things, and because people are not affected by racism, they don't want to take it forward. This is why I was talking about responsibility, that each time it has to be a black person's responsibility to speak on race, write about race, challenge about race. Where is the solidarity from my sisters and brothers who are not people of color? So this is why I'm saying it's our responsibility together. Where do we take this forward? Embed it in our mission, embed it in our ministry, embed it in our preaching, embed it in our teaching. Everything that we do has to be social justice. What does Luke say? What have I come to do? What does Jesus say to all of us? What have I come to do? We know that. So I think it's all up to all of us, not just certain people or certain groups who expect our leadership or expect the president of, of conference or expect a certain committee to do it. It's all our responsibility. This is what we preach every day. Yeah. I, um, uh, something else that's come out of Birmingham is uh, the chap called Robert Beckford. And I, I was in... Uh, in, in recent contact with him and he said to me I'm, I'm going to read I'm going to read something so um I asked if I could share this he said as long as I credit him so <laughs> <laughs> he said I've got a, a plan of action to move people on three or five points for radical change you can almost imagine him saying these things revolutionize theological education mandatory anti-racism training yes a mock yeah a moratorium on public school leadership appointments. Ouch. 
<laughs> Diversify every major committee. And then number five, free Aki and Saltfish at every service. <laughs> and number five is a fun one, but also it's a serious one. In terms of what food do you eat <laughs> when you go to church services and meetings? It all says monoculture. And so mm. there you go. That's uh, Rob Beckford's top five. <laughs> mm, mm. I agree with him, actually. Apart from the salt fish, where I'll bring my own sadza. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Um, we mainly constrained the questions to the chat to give um, our, our two guests most space to speak. Um, I want to though throw the floor slightly open and say, based on what we've heard, are there any other um, black people here who've been hearing things that either they want to um, challenge or that they want to amplify? This is a chance for you to to unmute and share. I'm just wondering whether hierarchical actually land up um, magnifying this problem. The fact that we, we want to have leaders who lead us from the top rather than actually having equality in decision making that includes the bottom. Eve, I think you'd also chip yeah, in as well. Yeah, I, I, I feel strongly that in order for the church to change, we have to retell the story. Uh, we, we have to talk about how we have taught people, a whole group of people, to accept that God did not make them to be precious in his sight and in the sight of the church. And what kind of stories of, how do we talk about ourselves? How does my white brothers and sisters talk about themselves? How do they see themselves? And I think it's going to take a lot of courage, men and women of courage in the church to actually re-examine the stories we tell about ourselves. Uh, because every, every community tells a story about themselves. But I think the consequences of the story that's been told for at least 400 years has gone so deep that we are going to have to re-examine that. That's going to be, going to be time consuming. But it's the only way forward because we can't use the old foundation to build a new house. Mm. My, my, my comment, uh, John, my, my comment, I've got two comments. The first comment I have is on, on silence. Why, why is it our brothers and sisters who are white are always silent when they see these racial incidences Farai was talking about and Azariah was talking about, why are they silent? Why do they not call out? You know, what is it that stops them from calling out some of these things? Because if they do, I think there will be, there will be change. Then my second comment is on, <laughs> since the beginning of all this, this whole issue with George Floyd, my sense is the community and society, particularly my brothers and sisters from the other side, from the, from, you know, the white brothers and sisters, are expecting us, the victim, to come up with the answers for racial injustice. I don't think it's fair, and I don't think it's the right thing to do. Why should we, the victims, provide the answers? Instead of either the other way, or as Farai and Azariah have been suggesting, we're working together to come up with answers. We are being expected, us, the victims, to be the panacea, to bring salvation. How does that work? Can I say something? Yeah, um, for me, in the last few weeks, what I've experienced is, is exactly what uh, Douglas uh, just said and Farai has um, 
that I've alluded to as well, that expectation, that weight, that, that burden seems to be placed on, on myself to the extent that you, you think, well, are people really wanting to engage with this or not? So you were sitting in a, a staff meeting. I, I'm a Methodist minister, and we know that conference has just um, agreed that circuits and churches should create forums for conversation to talk about racial inequality and to look at training and so on. I'm sitting in a meeting and I'm, and I'm saying, I'm reporting this back as, as a rep from conference, and there's total silence in the room. Nobody has to say anything. And then somebody says, well, or oh, can you, can you um, send us some pointers, send us some books to read? And on one hand, I want to do that because I do want to educate people. But on the other hand, I feel reticent in doing so because it then becomes my thing. And you know, as Farai said, it's an our thing. It's, this is a message of the gospel. The saying that racism is against the gospel of Christ that we preach. So therefore, it isn't my thing. And so uh, there was um, inclusive, inclusive Church um, on, on Facebook page are uh, going to be doing some conversations around race. And so a member of the congregation sent me this and say, oh, Ramona, this should be of interest to you. And I think, well, actually, this should be, this should be of interest to you. <laughs> exactly. Why, exactly. why exactly. do you think that that's for you? So the racial thing is for me? No, it's not for me. I already know how to be, no, how not to be a racist. You know, um, and I'm not trying to be derogative or anything, derogatory um, to anyone. But, but it's, it's how do you... How do you say that without people feeling sort of defensive? I think that's what I've been getting in the last weeks. People just being really defensive about anything you say, the conversations, wanting to dev deviate from the conversation of inequality, wanting to be distracted from the conversation we need to be having, um, which is about the gospel. And, and, and people, want, people are saying this is a political thing. This is about the people you're on the left and you're on the right. And I think, well, no, this is a Jesus thing. And uh, so how do I, as a, as a black woman, as a black minister, put that across to my, my white congregation members to say, you know, this is an all of this thing. And I, I, you don't want to feel as if you wouldn't want constantly talking about it because then people say, well, you're always talking about it. Exactly. exactly. It's a very difficult place to be and, and how do I find that balance? Um, and I don't quite know the answer. So I'm hoping somebody has some tips. I'm throwing it to you now. You know, how, how do I get people to have that conversation without seeing it as a Ramona thing? Because it, it isn't. I think sometimes it's deliberate that people want to make it about your thing, make it your thing. Then it just becomes another black rant a black woman ranting over something. And for, I, I'm not saying I'm skeptical, but I've seen it at play where people want to make it about you rather than the racism we're talking about. For example, this thing about the, the statue in Bristol, it has become about the statues rather than the systemic racism that we're talking about. This is just a diversion uh, 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 um, tactic that is employed by people who can face their own prejudice or their own attitudes that are embedded in their own hearts. Why are you trying to make it about me? Because I'm not, racism is not about me. I didn't bring it on. I am not a racist, but I am the victim of the, 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 the racist attitudes that are being thrown at me. So it's not my responsibility. This is why I say it is our responsibility together. This is something we do as disciples. I'm not asking people to change for me. I'm asking people to change for the, those on the margins, the list of these that we're called to stand up for. It's not about us. It's about all of us together. Thank you. I want to throw a mixture of Ramona and Douglas's question out to the white people in the room. And I want you to think carefully for yourself. And if one or two people are comfortable to then unmute and share. We've heard stories about people seeing racism, but yet their white colleagues and fellow Christians are not stepping in. But then as Azariah shared, 
once almost permission was given to name that that had been seen, suddenly people had seen it and were able to report it. So treating this as a, a safe space, would someone or someone, one or two people like share what stopped you from confronting something that you can see happening? I don't have um, a particular story in mind, but what I'm feeling inside myself is a, is a deep sense of, I just don't know how deep my brokenness runs. And if I open up to it, will I simply collapse? I am too, I am too frightened of that brokenness. And yet, I, as a Christian, I, I have come to understand that brokenness is a gift. But when, it, when I am confronted with a situation, my fear is so deep, um, the issues are entirely relational and immediate and complex and emotional, and I'm overwhelmed into silence. And I don't know how true that is, but I feel it's really important to say something about the depth of my brokenness being beyond what I can hold, or at least that is my fear. And I see that Danielle Wilson has, has typed in. Danielle, do you want to up, unmute and share? I wasn't expecting to, I was just writing it out. Um, I, I, I guess what, what my question was, what I was saying is that um, it's trying to get the balance right, I suppose, is what, what you're all talking about today. So in some of the like, faith spaces that I'm in, we're trying to do our own um, work by reading books and trying to talk together openly about um, how, we, how we become more anti-racist and, and learn. But we do want to also profile the voices of black people, black leaders, and I guess it's asking if there's any advice on how we do that in majority white populations in a way that is balanced and is sensitive. Okay. Hmm. John, in in our group, in our in our in our in our in our group, I don't know whether Caroline would want to share because we we talked briefly about this, and and and, and Caroline did Dave to share one or two things. I wonder she is on the platform whether she you can just call her out whether she wants to repeat what she said to us in our small group if she's comfortable to do so. If she's not, that's fine. Caroline. Yeah, I'm I'm happy if you want me to. I mean, I think for me. It's an acceptance of the racism within myself. And the desire to be liked, not to be impolite to somebody, and therefore I don't have sometimes have the right words, and so I go silent. And so I'm learning, just beginning on a journey, I think, to accept the racism within me and therefore to encourage other people to accept the racism in the inside themselves because I can't escape it you know I am I'm white I'm middle class I was well educated that is who I am you know so I, I because I'm well educated I have a a responsibility as well as a privilege to try to articulate in ways that are not rude but are challenging. I was thinking back, I didn't say it in our small group, but I was thinking back of when people said they'd had a visiting minister, I, I'm a retired minister, um, when they had a visiting minister and he was very nice but we couldn't hear what he was saying and instead of me saying actually that is a really really tough thing to say because if you couldn't hear somebody and the sound system wasn't working i hope that you would say to the sound engineer i couldn't hear was the system working you know 
to what what was it was it that you needed to say something or was it that actually you assumed you wouldn't hear you wouldn't understand what was it that was going on so i i dealt with those conversations at a very superficial level and i didn't actually challenge the racism in me and in them to say what what was it that made you think that you couldn't have an open and respectful conversation with somebody mm. because it's racist if you don't and and then grumble to me who wasn't there you know mm. it's ridiculous mm. so i think it's it's me facing the racism in me that stops me which mm. is the brokenness in me isn't it? Mm. thank you as our own for I, you've heard quite a varied conversation. You've seen it bubble up in the chat. It's getting late. We're all trying to find our light switches. Maybe it's time to begin to draw us to, to a conclusion. Sure. So I Your think final um, thoughts each. Sorry. Yeah. So um, one of the things in response to uh, uh, Danielle's uh, point about how to get that balance, Jesus sent the disciples out um, in twos. And I spoke about the book group where I said, can I bring a friend? Um, even in a conversation like this, there can be a sense, of, a sense of vulnerability. And so to flick through the gallery and see some, um, some darker faces, that can actually just add, it can give you a, a bit of extra strength and a bit of extra courage. Um, and so I, I would say um, to not have a person on their own doing something you know um because because there is an additional layer that they're having to go through if i was to ask you you know tell me what you talk to your therapist about you know <laughs> tell me if there's a member of your family in prison and why are they there tell me about the sibling you haven't spoken to in years and what was the source of that it's so personal you know it's exhausting and so having somebody else alongside just gives the extra courage and so for me it's been great to have um, for I here um, this evening because that's just given me a real sense of extra boost and courage so I'd like to pass on to my sister sorry I'm still on mute thank you for that as right it, it's mutual when, when I saw that you we were going to do this together I was uplifted and I thought yeah okay I can do this because I'm always nervous I'm always it is hard to do something like this on your own and you're very right you need your sisters and brothers to uphold you and and this is why i was talking about our leaders and our colleagues for for me personally in this circuit and this district they've all helped me and we're all doing it together we're doing it together we're having conversations together we're carrying each other we're having voices into what we are doing together and i think it, we're better off doing stuff together there's um an idiom in our language that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. Mm. If you want to go far, go far. together. Go together. Yes. Mm. So we'll go far if we go together. But if you want to go fast, run, sprint, that's okay. But I'm glad that we've done this together. And I'm glad that we're doing this together as disciples of Christ, all of us across denominations. Thank you. Mm. 